And we're going to turn to Psalm 91. Now, y'all may know this psalm. I'm just telling you, it's a psalm that has the potential, like all the word, to absolutely reshape your life. And and so as we look, we you know, we, we found ourselves wandering through the psalms. That's what we're calling this little series, right? We're just meandering through the psalms, wondering whatever word it is that you use. And that's what we're doing. And this psalm uh, was just on my mind all week. And uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, we're going to do this one. And uh, it's powerful. Uh, I remember it was a season in 2009 when I found myself in what I felt like was the biggest storm I had faced in quite a long time. And I thought, this might be what takes me. I had just come out of a storm a few years before that, thinking that was going to take me down, and it didn't. And so I found myself in a healthy place until it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? And then you think, okay, now what's going to happen? And I watched as, as uh, and, and this psalm is one of the ones I, I, I dug into deep. And, and I thought, I'm hanging, at, there, there's four movements in this, I'm hanging on to every one of these. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and I, I, if, if that's where the phrase, if God don't help, help ain't coming, that, that you have heard me say a lot, it's birthed out of, out of this. And, and so it's just, it means much to me. And so we're going to walk through it today. And let me just kind of give you a, a little, a little help in, in the Psalms. Uh, because, so there's a method in studying scripture. Let me give you a quick skinny on that. There's what we call the HGCL model of scripture. It's how you interpret the Bible. You have to do it, not as you read it through the lens of your life, but as you read it through the lens of those in whom God is speaking to at the moment. So when we're, when we're with the disciples, we should think like a disciple. That means I have to kind of know the background and the history of them. So uh, to, in order to interpret Scripture rightly, we have to find the historical aspect of what's going on in the context behind it. The next thing we do is grammar because it means something. Right, God. When God speaks and breathes the word, there's specific words that He uses, and we should know those words, and we should understand grammar, uh, and it makes a difference in so many ways. So some of us may hear the word, uh, "No one is born of God practices sin." So we hear that, and we go, "Well, we all sin." If you're a good student of the grammar. Now, your English Bible puts it in there, practice, because it's taking it out of the context that that's a perfect tense in the Scriptures. That means it's, a, it's an ongoing habit, so it uses the word practice. Without that, you're left to think, well, I sinned, therefore maybe I don't love God, or maybe, you know, whatever's going on. But it's those who practice sin. And I'm just giving you a little illustration before we jump into this. Um, and, and the other um, is uh, HGC uh, context. Right? You can't just, you don't like to be misquoted. We, we hear that all the time on here, you know, on TV or whatever. But somebody will give you a quote and they pulled it out and they took, they took one word off here, one word off here, and, that, and it made that person say exactly the opposite of what they were saying. Well, you can't do that with the Scripture. You can't just pull this out and use a passage of Scripture, you know, um, you know, my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. That means he's, everything I need, He's going to give me. You know, it, it is. But let's define what that term need is. Right, and the scripture does that out of context. Uh, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, we want to take that to the football field and all of those other things. But was that really what Paul meant when God gave him those words? We use it as an application. Nothing wrong with that. But to be a good student, we should interpret correctly. And the other is literal, right? That we take the literal sense of the scripture. But that doesn't mean that when Jesus says he's a door, we go, well, then I guess he's a door. We understand literally. It was a metaphor written in the text. I tell you that because they're going to read some things through Psalms. We do the same thing with Proverbs. Proverbs aren't promises that you and I grab hold of. They're principles that we live by. And so, and I don't mean to shatter your concepts of things and, and, and pull things out from underneath you that you, you felt like, you know, I just pulled the rug out from underneath you. But, you know, when we, when we use, when we look at Scripture... Uh, this is train up a child in the way he should go, and he's old. He won't. He won't. Re, uh, he will return to it. Won't depart from it. That's not a promise. It's a principle that that is in the scriptures. And, and 
I get, I know some of you are like, oh, what? You know, but but it's not it's not some carte blanche guarantee. It is that the principle is if we ingest truth into our kids' lives, it stays with them forever. And and so just I hope that's making sense to you. It's just important that we do that. So we get into this psalm. We're going to read some things here. We're going to go really. And so uh, you know, I, and, and I'll I'll bring that as we get there. I just want you to understand we're looking at this from this historical type perspective. Before we do, let me just talk about this. Storms are coming, right? Have you realized that? Are you in a storm right now, Linda? <laughs> right? And, and, and is Harlem in a storm right now, right? And, and that means you are because someone you love is in, in the midst of some trouble, right? And so we know this principle. In life, we are either heading into a storm, we are in a storm, or we just got out of one. And, and if we don't understand that about life, we're going to miss the best that God has for us. I mean, it could, it could be health, right? It could be emotion. Uh, it could be relational. It could be financial. All of those things are areas in which we can find ourselves in a storm, right? I mean, sometimes you realize you've got a need and you don't have any money to, make that, to, to meet that need. That's a storm. It may, and it may, be, it may be insignificant in your world, but it's not to the one that's going through it, Right? And it's easier for us to look at them going through the storm as, well, they should have saved better. Well, they should have made better investments. Well, they shouldn't have bought that, right? But, but at the moment, that doesn't solve their problem. They're in a storm. And so this is what we're looking at. The truth is, this is what this psalm really does. The God of all creation is deeply in love with you. You should know that. Because this is what this text speaks of. He is concerned with your storms and how you respond in that storm. Don't think that he's missing that. Don't always assume a storm comes and he's punishing. Right? We know that because Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together. Right? So, this thing came into my life. Joseph would be an example of that. Right? The, Joseph didn't ask. I mean, he sort of put himself in that position where he goes, look at me, I got the favorite coat, right? And, and I had this cool dream. But the bottom line was his brothers threw him in a pit, not, not for any other reason than envy and, and just evil. But God was using that to accomplish the very dream that Joseph was all proud about. I'm sure if Joseph had known he was going to go through all of these valleys to accomplish that dream, he would have said, you know, you can probably give that dream somebody else, <laughs> right? And because we, we miss, and so sometimes storms are coming and we think this is the end of it. This is, this is going to take me down. If it's ever going to, this is it. And we didn't realize it's just God's just setting it up because he has other things that he wants to teach you. He let it come into your life because it sifted through his hand because he said, this will be good for part two. He may not get it now. But man, if that boy will, will, will be consumed with who I am in the process of that, and he'll trust me, and he'll love me, I'm going to take it. I'm going to fix it. This is the promise that we're going to find. I know I'm kind of telling you what I'm going to tell you. That's the old preacher that kind of deal. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I told you, right? That's how preachers preach. But, but, uh, but I just want us to understand this. He cares about you. Every problem my kids have matters to me, right? From little to big, it matters. Every one of them. There's not one of them I go, just go talk to somebody else. I'm not interested in that. No, it matters. And if the God who created you and drew you to himself and sacrificed his son for you allows something in your life and you are, you are in the midst of something, He's deeply invested and deeply interested in what's going on in your life. So you, you, that tr if they don't go any further, you need to grab that truth. There's not one thing you're going through that God is not invested with you. Why? Because of what we just talked about, the Holy Spirit. He resides in me. He's vested in me. And so it matters. Because one, I reflect His glory. And two, He loves me. And so this is where we're going. Difficulty has been part of God's people all through time, right? I mean, we know that. I and mean, we could go on and on about all that. God's people, 
his people always remain optimistic about the temporary nature of trials. My mom was one of those type people. This too shall pass. I have a sign in my office that reminds me that my mama used to always tell me that at every turn. This too shall pass, right? And, and so we know that. We know these storms come. Now, sometimes they don't pass the way we want them to, right? I mean, sometimes it's like passing it means you're out of here. But that's, it, that's not a negative. We see it that way, but it's not a negative. Maybe for those of us who are left behind, but not for the one that went. Go ask any of your loved ones who are in heaven now if they would like to come back and hang out for a minute. No, they wouldn't, right? And so today we're looking at this Psalm 91. And uh, at, like, at first reading, it gives the impression that you and I are like Teflon or we're wearing some kind of Kevlar suit. And, and if that were true, because when David speaks of these things like he's invincible, the reality is you and I are all, and I learned this years ago, we're invincible until God says otherwise, right? If he truly has, and we believe that he has numbered our days before the foundation of the world, I'm not going to get out of here one second earlier or later than when he decreed because he's that sovereign. And so, so if David believed, the, this is where it goes to the promise and principle kind of thing. If David believed what we're getting ready to look at, look at he wouldn't have hidden from Saul. He would have looked at him and said, hey, take your best shot, bro. He wouldn't have run from Absalom, his son, when Absalom decided he hated his dad and he was going to kill him and he was going to sleep with all of his wives because, you know, that's just how he was going to roll. David would have said, all right, big boys, try it. But, but he did hide. So I say that not to diminish the principles that we're learning here, but to help us understand what a psalm is. A psalm is the expression of a soul, Right? I mean, when you listen to artists and you hear the stories where these songs came from, don't you love those things, right? It's the expression of a soul. That's exactly what you and I are. That's what it says in Ephesians when it says, that when, it, when it says we are his workmanship, we're his poema. We, we are the poem uh, that he wrote down. He, from his soul, he crafted me uniquely, and I am the expression of his soul. He did the same thing for you. That means we all have value and we're all unique because the Creator saw something in us by his own choosing, and says, I'm going to do that because I've got good works for Pardue to do on this planet. And I've got good works for you to do. Now, that's my intro to the text. The text flows rather easily. And so let's just look at it. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and to my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. You know what we find here? The whole concept that in the midst of the storm, there is rest. There, it doesn't have to be unrest. It doesn't have to be turmoil. It doesn't have to be that. That was the lesson on the boat when, when the storms were coming and Jesus is sleeping and like, what's going on with you? Don't you see the storms? Yeah, I'm sure he saw them. I'm sure he... He, in fact, he's the one who commanded the storm to come because he just as easily told it to be still. So why was he not fraught? Because Jesus rested in everything the Father had told him, right? And so this is why, and listen, you may not need this now because maybe you're right, not, not right now you're not in a storm. But when you go into a storm, you're going to want to pull this out and you're going to want to see this. Whoever dwells, that is to, this, this is not the house of God, this place. If this were a church building, it's not the house of God. It's not a sanctuary. It's none of those things. That may have been what happened with the temple in the old days and the Holy of Holies, but that's not where the, that's not where God resides anymore. He resides in you and me. This, this is the temple. So what does it mean to dwell in the shelter of the Most High? His presence, right? That's where I go. I'm going to dwell in His presence. That's the song about consuming, right? Shelter, that's that dwelling place. So the presence of God is what he's speaking of. Whoever dwells in the presence of the Most High. That's a powerful term, right? That means... Where I'm dwelling, when I'm in the presence of God Almighty, 
There is no one higher than Him. He's the Most High. He possesses everything. And He's in my corner. He's in your corner. We, we tend to allow the evil one to make us think that when a hard time comes, it's like, well, maybe I did something wrong. Or maybe whatever. Or maybe. No, no, stop it. Look, He's in your corner. If you, if you come into His presence, if you did it wrong, and you come into His presence, He will love you. And so this is a powerful deal. He gives us rest in the midst of our troubles. Why? Because He is Almighty. I will rest in the shadow of who? The Almighty. The provision and the provider. The provision for my storm is the Almighty. Not not wisdom, not, a, not an attorney, not the right person, not money. My provision is the Almighty. He can give me whatever provision I need for this storm, and I'm going to trust that He will meet my needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. And so there's that provision. And then He says this, I will say of the Lord... That's the term Jehovah. You know what that term means? Promise keeper. So not only do I have the provision of God, I have the promise of God that this storm is going to be okay. It may mean my death. Maybe it does mean certain things that you don't think you want. Maybe it does mean going into the pit. Maybe it does mean be, being accused like Joseph of a, of, a, of a sin and a rape that you didn't commit, and so you find yourself in jail. But he will, and he promises, right? I say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. That's the term Elohim. That term means power. So if you're paying attention, when we dwell in the presence of God, three things are immediately there with us. His provision, his promise, and his power. That's why we rest. I'm in the shelter. Oh, I, I, wish, I wish I'd have brought food in here. Hey, guess what? He covered that. He's, he's provided in this shelter. He, that provision's there, right? Oh, man, I don't know. Do you think this? Think we can withstand this? I don't know. Well, he promised that we could. So I don't have to worry about whether this thing's going to collapse. No, I have the promise of God himself that what this shelter is sufficient. And he has the power to turn that storm any way he wants to. This is good. This is good. I like this. Now, verse 3 and 4. It's, it, we're going to get faster, I think, maybe. I don't know. I'm having too much. Man, this is good. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. Now, these are the promises that he's given to us. He offers you his protection. This is what we're learning right here, three and four. He, he's, we're seeing four movements. And he, the first thing he offers us is his protection. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. I have his protection. Greater is he who is within me. And he is in all. It, I am Teflon. I'm invincible until God says otherwise. What can the enemy do to me? What shall separate me from the love of Christ? It's a persecution? Sword? Famine? No, all these things, I've got all the protection that I need. I'm more than a conqueror. I, I don't. This is the deal. Sometimes our storms are people, aren't they? And here's the deal: I don't have to fight that fight. I don't have to fight that fight. And there were times. Ministry's brutal. And there was a time when Tammy was getting so upset because people were saying things about me and, and her and everything else that wasn't true. And she's like, "They're telling everybody all this stuff." What? Like, I know. But I don't have to worry about going out and defending that. My God will fight my fight. I'm going to keep doing the right thing. I can't control what people say. 
And if I start worrying about all of that, this storm's going to overtake me. So I'm just going to, I'm going to rest in his protection. I'm going to assume he'll confuse my enemies. <laughs> it's really a story. Corey Tinboom writes, if you know her, she grew up and in a household that protected the the Germans, I mean the uh, the the um, Israelis, Jews in World War II. She eventually got captured. Her and her sister both. They went to prison. Her, her sister died in, in the Nazi prison camps. Her dad was killed. She survived, and she told her stories. This was something I learned when I was probably late seventies, early eighties. I got to hear her speak, and I read her book. There's a story she tells in the book from her journey in the prison camps. And it says this, there was a man that was reading this very psalm, Psalm 91. And he was frustrated because like, I don't want to die. And he knows everybody's dying. He's like, I don't want to die in this prison camp. And he's reading Psalm 91. And he's saying, God, how come I'm in this? Why can't I do anything? Believe this story or not, but the man heard God say, well, get up and leave. This man got up, walked out of his cabin, walked to the gate. The guards pull out their, their guns, look at him. And he says, I'm under orders of the Most High. And they stood aside and they opened the gate. This man got to every checkpoint. He literally walked from that prison camp all the way through Germany. And at every step, his answer was, I'm under order of the Most High. It wasn't until he got to the end that he realized that the Germans called Hitler most high. Now, I don't know if it was because... So we have three things. You can either believe this is a fake story, but I don't. That the, that the soldiers simply thought he meant Hitler had told, them, told him to leave. Or that it was just God himself who was in deeply in love with this man, who trusted him at his word to say, well, then get up and leave that caused that to happen. And I think there are so many times that you and me wrestle in our storm because when he's told us what we ought to do, we're too afraid to do it. And he's saying, listen, I'm your protection. Trust me. The hardest thing that I ever did was resign from the church that I'd started 15 years earlier because it's just, it, it feels like failure. But I knew the Lord was saying, just resign. And I had a lady confirm it to me. But I realized it was exactly what God wanted in my life. And had I not done that, I, my life would have been different. Y'all might be better. I wouldn't be your pastor. But but at the same time, it was like one of those things. I, I didn't know where I was going to go. It wasn't like I had money. You know, well, I just quit. You know, and it's not like I was doing it for the money. I'm just saying it really just, we were vulnerable at that point. And I watched God meet my needs in a way that I never would have. And I grew at that time in ways I never would have grown before. And I just, this is powerful to me. He is our protection. He is, if he speaks and we walk underneath the counsel of his word, just like that man did. God said, <clears throat> leave. And what was his umbrella? Most high said, this is what I do. It carried him all the way through enemy land, all the way out to the other side. This is good stuff. Verse 5 and 10. Not only does he offer our protection, but he offers his peace. Look at this. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. Now, that's power. This is the verse that can sometimes trip us up because we, we think, well, then that means I'm invincible. It does to the same degree that like Joseph, like the children of Israel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? My God is able to deliver us. 
But they submitted to this. And even if he doesn't spare us, we ain't bowing down. Right? But he did spare them. Why? Because they're invincible until God says otherwise. Right? I mean, we all know we're going to die. I mean, that, unless the Lord comes back but before that, we're all going to. So let's don't think that we're in, that this means we're going to live forever. We could take it that way, it almost looks like. So let's be wise in how we understand the scriptures. But this is powerful. He offers us his peace there. When we know whose we are, we don't, we don't have to panic. Because he tells me what's going to happen. My, my fight, our fight is always in the mind. Be anxious for nothing and in everything through prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which uh, guards your hearts. And it does so and it gives you a peace that the world can't understand. Right? That's the whole point. It's incomprehensible. We think it can't happen. But it does. You and I have to be renewed in that whole concept. God never leaves us alone. And so we trust Him. And there's peace in the midst of that storm. And this is, this is what this passage is speaking of. We're not done yet. God offers us, and this is the preacher coming out in me because it's alliterated. He offers us His platoons. Now really what He's offering us is His heavenly warriors but I call it platoons because it helps me remember this lesson. But listen to what it says, verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will, tre you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. What's he saying? I got, I got heavenly warrior. You're not alone, bro. I didn't leave. I gave you the Holy Spirit. And the writer of the Hebrews was gracious enough to tell us that angels are ministering servants to you and to me, right? To serve us on this planet. How many, we, we, all, we all see the evil. We all believe that. Oh, devil's in that man, right? That man was led by a demon or whatever. But it seems like the church fails to understand that God has heavenly angels, warriors, that he uses on your behalf and on my behalf, and we may never even see it. Psalm 34, 7. Maybe we'll look at that one soon. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Right? I ain't got no worries. I'm never alone. He's got, I don't, I don't need simply safe. I don't need ring. I don't need any, I mean, we use it. I, I don't need that. Around my house, the Lord is encamped. That's why you can, wherever you, wherever you go, you're not in danger in that sense. Are not all his angels ministering spirits, right? You know the story. I love the reminder. Elisha's got a young servant who's freaked out because he wakes up, steps out the tent, and sees this incredible army standing to invade. And he runs back in to tell Elisha, you need to get up, man. This bad. It's bad out there. And Elisha, the old prophet, gets up, walks outside, looks at the army, looks at his servant, and he says, Lord, would you, would you open his eyes? Right? And we know what he says. There are more of us than there are of them. I'm never alone. It doesn't matter where we go. We're never alone. His heavenly warriors and his spirit. If it was just his spirit, I'm good. I'm not even, I'm not even that. His heavenly host is brought to bear. Jesus lived that way. When Pilate was, don't you know I have the authority to take your life? Jesus, like the prophet Elijah, goes, you may not know this, but uh, I, I could right now call 10,000 angels down here and you'd wet your pants. I mean, that literally, I mean, that's kind of, that's what he's saying there, right? I mean, it's crazy when you start thinking about it. There's another story I'd read years ago by a man named John Patton, who's a missionary. And, and you may believe or not believe this one. I have a friend too, Dean Self. There's a little road down the street from us uh, called Self Road. And his family lived here. He's a local boy. Uh, 
and he served the Lord in Bolivia, and it was some terribly tough test, t uh, territory, and, and he had his life threatened. And I remember Dean Self telling us, you know, we act like prayer, we want prayer more than we do money. He said, I'm telling you, when I was in that situation, your money wouldn't have helped me, but your prayers did. Because God sent his angels to spare my family during that time. But, but let me tell you John Patton's story. So he's in the jungle. And the natives have decided to attack. He's trying to reach them with the gospel of Christ. And uh, Patton, uh, uh, John Patton sees all the men coming to his house. And so he and his wife gather in their, in their house and they, they pray. Just pray. The, the, the night goes. They didn't attack. He's out reaching them with the gospel of Christ. The church is finally established and there's some, and, and the language barrier has now been breached. And so he's able to discuss with them the scriptures and there's a church. And so he asks them, what, what was going on that night when all you men wanted to come and, and kill us? I mean, we knew you were, we saw what was going on. They said, man, you had so many men in front of your house. There was no way we could, we could attack you. And John was like, I don't have any men. The only answer to that is his heavenly host stood between him and those evil people. I'm just telling you, this psalm is more powerful than we can comprehend. We have to rest in him. Now, th but these last three verses, and I'm gonna, we're going we're to be done. This, this, of all of them, this one blows my mind. So, so God, God doesn't, doesn't only offer me his protection and his peace and his platoons, but he offers me his promises. Listen, this, this will blow your mind. Verse, verse 14. Listen, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. Catch that. You love Jesus? He promises he's going to rescue you. Well, what, what's the condition of that promise? Well, he says, I will rescue you. Based on what? Because Pardue loves me, I'm going to rescue him. Right? It, see, that, that's a crazy thing when you think about it. <laughs> he is with those who trust him. This is our problem. That storm comes and I start trusting in my, my words or my, my money or my, my um, eating right. Or, right? And we're not, we're not, we're not going. Oh, I love you, God. I mean, I love you. That's this is the most crucial piece. Because I love Him, He promises what? All that He talked about. I'm a rescue. That part of it, He's a scoundrel. He put Himself in that storm. But man, that boy loves me. And snap. Angel's gonna come. Hey, go, 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 fix it. Go, go, take care of. Come on, I'm telling you, this is a deal. Listen to what he says. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. Why? Because I acknowledge the name of the Lord. Don't forget the power. We, don't we sing about that? There's power in the name of Jesus. Not mystical stuff. It's like, it's, it's like calling your dad when you're in trouble. I had a buddy of mine, David Elliott. He's still a friend of mine. He was, we were in high school together. and He was like 6'8". And I was like barely six foot and skinny as a rail. But I knew if he was around, I never had to worry about anything. Because anybody, we were friends. If anybody trashed me and said something to me, David Elliott was going to squash him. Right? Why? Well, because because I, he's my buddy. Because I acknowledge he's my buddy. This is what God does. I, hey, I'm calling the name of Jesus. I, because I acknowledge him. This is what he says. I will protect them. Why? For he acknowledges my name. Quit putting your trust in all your junk. Even if it's good stuff. It's got to be in him. I will be with him in trouble. Right? In trouble. Who is in the fire with, with those three Hebrew children? Right? Where was he? Exactly where David says he is. They acknowledged his name. We will not bow down. And even if you throw me in that fire, and even if our God takes it, we still ain't bowing down because we trust in him. So where what was did he fulfill the promise to them? Yes. Who was in the fire with? Him? Right? There were four, remember? Not three. I'm telling you, this is good. I will deliver him. This and I will God's gonna honor me. 
that seems so messed up. That's one of those things you're like, no, 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 no. I, no, no. God most high is not going to honor me. But he says so, you know, for two reasons. I love him and I acknowledge his name. There, there, there's, there's, there's no special thing needed in your life or my life. It doesn't take anything special to love him, right? That's not like, well, I don't have the gifts. or No, it's not about any gift or calling. You just love him and you acknowledge that you need him. This psalm is powerful. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And God is faithful to the end. He is with those who trust in him. Listen, God can't. This the one thing God can do is make you love Him. I mean, He could, but but why would He? Right? That's not the point. He He can do everything else. Loving Him is the one thing that we that He lets us choose to do, and and, and it makes sense. You know, that's why He's always wooing us, right? That's why He's always like, come on, come on. He it's He wants us to love Him. Think about it. I mean, I don't know why Tammy loves him, but she chose to. But if when we were dating, she didn't, and I had some magic pill I could give her and it would make her love me, that'd be amazing for a little bit, right? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not going to lie. That'd be awesome. But at some point, I'm going to realize she only loves me because she's taking a pill. I, I don't, I want her to love me because she loves me, right? And I got to believe God's the same way. He's not just going to give us a pill. Oh, there you go, love me. But everything he does was a demonstration of his love for you. And if we just simply love him back, his promises are ours. In the midst of my stupid, he rescues me. And he will be with me in my troubles. Because of two things. I decided to hide out in him, or three things. Rest in him, love him, and acknowledge him. Man, that's good. That's a great, that's a great psalm. I may preach that next week. Oh, man. Let's sing our way out of here.